Um, so to start with, just an overview of what we can talk about. I want to, first of all, um, emphasize, well, first of all, it'd be good to try and define what acute kidney injury is and to emphasize as to why it's important for our patients, for all children, whether they have an underlying kidney condition or not. And then some of the issues we have with classifying acute kidney injury, uh, which is a murky area, always has been. And then um, what we can do about it. And then we'll finish off, if we have some time with some cases, we can work through and hopefully you can make it as interactive as possible. If anyone has any questions or comments, please do put them through on the chat screen and we can address those as we go along. So first of all, what is acute kidney injury? Um, and I always love asking this question. It's much more easier in a in a in a room of people who you can talk to. But can anyone um, try and offer an, a definition of acute kidney injury, either by unmuting yourselves or by putting it on the chat screen? So I'll I'll carry on. Um, it's a an acute loss of normal kidney function. Um, resulting in uh, a reduction in your GFR, glomerular filtration rate, accompanied by an impairment of electrolyte, acid base, and fluid balance. It's a very neat way of describing the whole cascade of things that happen during acute kidney injury, but I think it's always worth taking these um, definitions a bit further and trying to understand exactly what's going on with some of the pathophysiology behind these processes. So everyone will recognize this. This is a nephron and it is a glomerulus um, here, which I can, Julia, can you just, can anyone, can you see my mouse if I use it as a pointer? I can, yes, yeah. we can. So everyone can see, excellent, thank you. Everyone can see the, the glomerulus here. And then just as a reminder, this is the, these are the, the, the tubules. So you've got the proximal levofenly and distal convoluted tubules. Uh, followed by the collecting ducts. So when you have an acute kidney injury, you have an injury to mostly your tubular cells. So these are very oxygen dependent and have high metabolic activity um, and very sensitive to changes in your oxygen and fluid requirements. And so when you do have an, uh, an insult to your tubular cells, um, there's a whole cascade of things that can happen to reduce your glomerular filtration rate to reduce the blood flow going through glomerulus, resulting in an elevated creatinine and reduction in kidney function. So there is a, a feedback loop using adenosine as from released by your tubules, which acts directly upon your afferent, afferent arterioles. There is sympathetic activation, um, which can cause efferent constriction. Endothelin ones released during an inflammatory process other inflammatory processes um, release platelet aggregation factor and reactive oxygen species and just generalized cell edema can result all in a reduction in your glomerular filtration rate, usually through constriction of the efferent arterial, which is the, the outflow of your glomerulus. Um, and then all of that can then lead on to a cascade of um, things that happen, including inflammatory responses. You get neutrophil infiltration of your interstitium and you get a T cell response and severe cytokine release, which can cause a, if you like, a worsening feedback loop of in increasing inflammation and worsening tubular dysfunction and uh, reduction in your glomerular filtration rate. So I think just going, stepping back, we've talked a lot about what happens here. The injury happens in your, tubular structures in your nephron, but it appears that the in entirety of mechanism of reduction in GFR always happens here at the glomerulus. And the glomerulus isn't ever injured. It's always the tubular structures that are sensitive to injury. And so looking more into that, why is it? And can anyone, again, everyone, anyone can answer or try to answer, putting this in the chat screen or unmuting yourself, why if the injury is happening in the in the tubular structures, do we have such a severe response in the glomerulus? What's happening in the glomerulus when it's not actually affected? Can anyone proffer an idea as to why that's the case? So, so moving on, I think I wanted to try and explain what, what do the tubules, what do your tubules and your nephrons actually do and what they're responsible for? So we all know 
and they're responsible for the reabsorption of the in, almost the entire tree of our filtrate. So most of the solute and water that we filter from our glomerulus is reabsorbed in your tubular structures. And so if we quite try and quantify exactly what our tubules do, if you have a GFR of 100 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, that's equivalent of 180 liters of filtrate every day and about one kilogram of table salt every day and about half a kilogram of bicarbonate every day and 145 grams of glucose. There's a huge amount of fluid and solute that your kidneys filter on a daily basis. And it's the responsibility of our tubules to reabsorb almost the entire tree of that, more than 99% of that much solute. And the rest of it is excreted in your urine. But the vast majority of all of that solute and fluid is, and water is reabsorbed um, by our tubules. So if our tubules become damaged, um, if they become injured and they're unable to do this really essential job, then within a few hours, we would be severely fluid depleted and we wouldn't survive for very long if um, our tubules leaked this much fluid, water, electrolytes. Um, from being injured, from being incapacitated by any kind of insult. So our glomerulus takes over at this point. When we have an acute kidney injury and there's injury to our tubules, we have all of these mechanisms to reduce our GFR, if you like, to protect us from this severe loss of electrolytes and water. So when we talk about acute kidney injury and we talk about this process of severe reduction in GFR and a rise in creatinine is actually a protective process. It protects us from losing this much solute and water. So you could argue that the name of acute kidney injury and calling it a problem is actually um, a misnomer and we should call it acute kidney success because this is probably what keeps many of us alive whenever we have an insult to our kidneys. And that's an evolutionary process that all mammals have developed in order to, to protect our to protect us and to survive whenever our kidneys become injured. So the reduction in GFR is a deliberate and essential process to protect us. So what we as physicians have to try and determine is, um, or try to uh, manage is, can we prevent this from becoming more pathological? Can we prevent this from having more long-term consequences to our, to our kidney function and structure over time? So moving on from the pathophysiology, the, the next question clinically for us, first of all, is uh, about the importance of acute kidney injury. So when, I, um, when we all start our training and so on, we talk about acute versus chronic kidney injury. And this is certainly the kind of impression I had during my training is that AKI is a reversible process. It's easily detectable with a simple blood test called creatinine, and it can't be treated anyway. So it's an, an inevitability in many situations. So not worth really investing too much time and effort into thinking about. And I wanted to try and address those issues and hopefully dispel some of these myths. So first of all, um, thinking about um, the outcomes of our patients and the reversibility um, and starting with the short-term outcomes. So there's been plenty of evidence in the past couple of years when you look at especially intensive care patients about their mortality in the short term. So in children um, who are admitted to intensive care, the likelihood of them dying during their admission is almost directly proportional to their stage of AKI, which means the worse the acute kidney injury they have, the more likely they are to die. And that's an independent process away from any other confounding factors. So it's important to remember that in, the, in acutely unwell children and in intensive care children, that your level of acute kidney injury can, uh, can lead to a higher risk of mortality. So it, it is important in those most severe cases. But then, as we all know, a lot of children or most children do survive their episodes of acute kidney injury. So um, what are the long term effects of this? So there's been a meta analysis about 10 years ago, um, uh, looking at the long term risk of chronic kidney disease after an acute kidney injury in the systematic review, looked at about 12 papers. Uh, sorry, 10 papers. There was um, an analysis of 346 children with a mean follow-up of six years. You can already see the inherent issue with that. When we talk about long-term follow-up, if the mean follow-up is only six years, there's still not a huge amount of data looking into the much longer-term um, effects of acute kidney injury. 
These were all very sick children. You can see 44% of them received the dialysis and 24% died during their acute admission. So these are, if you like, severe acute kidney injuries. Um, and when you look at the long-term sequelae, you can see that, um, that and I want you to look at the pool, the incidence column here, you can see that um, almost over one in 10 children who had an acute kidney injury had future follow-up proteinuria. Um, and that a third, almost a third of children had a GFR of less than 90. So they had a chronic kidney disease, stage two or more. And then 3% of them had a chronic kidney disease, um, which is more severe with a GFR of less than 60. And then 0.4% ended up in end-stage kidney disease. Um, and there was also an increased incidence in long-term mortality. And when you compare long-term mortality to other conditions, such as patients who've had hemolytic uremic syndrome or a Ewing sarcoma, having an AKI in this meta-analysis had a high incidence of long-term mortality, um, not quite as high as those who've been admitted to intensive care. So I think in summary, just to, um, to summarize on that, it's important to remember that, that long, uh, acute kidney injury can lead to long-term problems. It can lead to proteinuria, to blood pressure problems, and to chronic kidney disease, which in the future may result in a um, need for renal replacement therapy. Of course, the data is only six years old as a mean for these patients, so it's important for us to follow up on that and look for longer-term data in our patients who've had acute kidney injury. So one of our colleagues in Great Ormond Street, Dr. Hayes, has put this um, infographic together, which is really helpful, I think, to, to try and understand the processes that happen during acute kidney injury. If you look at the green um, line, these are the functional markers of, a, of an acute kidney injury, of acute insult to um, injury, where the functional markers don't go up until a bit later on, uh, whereas you might have some damage markers. So these are as yet um, not... Uh, these are tests that we could use in the future to try and identify any kidney injury earlier. Um, and once you've had an insult, you have um, a development phase where the insult is happening where we won't so much be aware of it because there won't be any functional markers to tell us about that. And then as the injury progresses through the kidney, you can see that you get to rise in these functional markers to reduce your inhibit and an increase in creatinine. Um, and then this extension phase is, is, if you like, the the golden window of when we can do something about it, whether we can try and help with a, a adaptive repair and continue with a full recovery, or whether if this extension phase is prolonged and the acute kidney injury isn't addressed, might lead to a maladaptive um, repair resulting in recovery of kidney function, but not down to normal, and might lead to longer term consequences and sequelae. So our aim is always to try and promote an adaptive repair of our kidney kidneys and improve our kidney function back to baseline, rather than helping them, if you like, limp through their episode of AKI with an increased chance of a maladaptive repair. <laughs> so I want to dispel the myth that AKI is fully reversible. I think in, in most cases it is, and we'd um, hope to always encourage this, but it's not a given and it's not always the case. So it's important for us to try and um, to try and mitigate against that and do everything we can to prevent it from having long-term problems. The next thing we're going to talk about is, is um, acute kidney injury easy to recognize. So for something to be easily recognized, it's important that it's easily defined. Um, and there are problems with defining acute kidney injury. So if you if you did a PubMed search of the incidence of acute kidney injury, for example, in the intensive care patients, and you'd think within ICU patients who are so closely monitored, it'd be easy to try and um, pinpoint the prevalence of AKI. You can see that the prevalence ranges between different units, between 1% to 25% of ICU patients, um, with different populations, of course, with mortality rates ranging from 15 to 60%. So these are hugely wide, um, markers, if you like, um, and EVA indicates there's such wide variation in practice between all of those publishing centers. Or um, another explanation could be that it's a difficult area to study and that definitions are not uniform across um, all areas. So um, if you go back through history, you can see that there have been lots of attempts to try and name this condition and to study it. and um, 
if, if you can't define it, it's difficult to study. And these, if you like, are all the different names that have been given to acute kidney injury in the past. And um, following this, we've had acute, and we'll all remember what it used to be called acute kidney failure. And we've stopped using the word failure. Now we call it acute kidney injury because we don't think it's so much a failure, but an adaptive response. And maybe even acute kidney injury might change in the future. We don't know. But more importantly than just giving it a name is also the classification system. So there are three main classification systems which complicates things. There's the P-Rifle classification system. There's the acute kidney injury network classification system. So P-Rifle came in 2004 by the Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative Group. Aiken came in 2007, late, three years later, by the Acute Kidney Injury Network. And then KDIGO, which is uh, Kidney Disease and Improving Global Outcomes, um, tried to, if you like, consolidate these two different classification and these criteria um, so that we had a unified um, effort in defining and classifying AKI. And this is really important for being able to report on outcomes because if you can't define AKI properly and have a unified approach, then it's very difficult to, to have um, uh, reportable outcomes that we can compare over time between different populations and, um, and between different centers. So at the moment, we are opting for KDIGO. So if, if you ever have, um, and that's consensus ac across the International Pediatric Nephrology Association, if, if we're trying to classify AKI and we're trying to use any stratification system, um, we should try and consolidate and use KDIGO as a unified worldwide approach to defining acute kidney injury. Um, and does it, and also just a, um, a mention, does it matter what you use, whether you use P-Rifle, AKIN, or um, KDIGO? And this was a really neat study looking at um, almost 15,000 hospitalizations in Stanford between 2006 and 2010. And they defined AKI for every single hospitalization, depending on, on all three different criteria. Um, and um, the incidence of AKI varied between 37% and 51%, depending on which definition you use. But most importantly, all three definitions correlated with outcomes equally, and they demonstrated interstage discrimination. That is to say that there was a difference in outcomes between the stage one, two, and three for each criteria. So in actual fact, materially, clinically, it doesn't matter which one you use, but for consistency, we're, we're starting to move towards KDIGO as a, a unified criteria. But it's taken a long time to get to this place, but that, that's where we are now. So these are the, just to, I'll flash it here for you guys to see stage one, two, and three. Um, and um, we, we talk about for children, um, an increase in serum creatinine 1.5 to 1.9 times the baseline um, for stage one, and then increased by 200% stage two and 300% for stage three. You can also use urine output as a metric for acute kidney injury as well, which is important. Um, so when we talked about whether it's easily detectable or not, um, we've had problems in the past with classifying it. So hopefully that will now be easier now that we've had a more unified classification system. But then let's look at the actual tests that we have. So at the moment, our best marker of, a, of our kidney function is a creatinine. Um, and this would be, if you like, this, um, this graph would show you the perfect blood test or the perfect urine test for uh, an acute kidney injury. That is at time zero is when the insult happens to the, in the kidney, your levels of this marker would go up immediately and would be sustained until the kidney is recovered. In actual reality, you can see that all of the attempted markers, all, all of the attempted functional markers of your kidney function don't increase immediately. And there is always a time lag between um, the, the actual insult and the peak levels of these functional markers. And then if you follow my arrow here, this dotted line here is your creatinine. So you can see only at 24 hours after the insult does your creatinine peak. So when you, when you look at your blood test for a patient and you see that they have a, a high creatinine indicating acute kidney injury, unfortunately, that only tells you that that creatinine reflects the status of that kidney yesterday, 24 hours ago. And you might in the intervening 24 hours have had plenty more injury that we've not addressed and plenty more problems. So um, 
it's, it's a disappointment to be like in this test that it doesn't give you an immediate indication of how well the kidneys are doing at that moment in time and it's often too late to fix what you've already um what you're noticing in terms of protecting the kidneys from any further damage um so important to realize in context what the creatinine actually means which is your your kidney function 24 hours ago you can see there are some other markers which are mostly urine markers functional markers of the kidney um, which have been investigated and are still being investigated um, and in particular one that um, has garnered some interest is NGAL which has been shown to peak at about 12 hours after an ICU admission um, so it'd be like 12 hours before creatinine peaks and it's been used in some critically ill patients particularly in adults um, uh, and it shows relatively good sensitivity and specificity but there are problems with this assay and stability of the assay the cost of it um, availability at point of care as well so at the moment we don't have anything practically better than a creatinine but there's been a lot of work to try and investigate especially urine biomarkers if there's anything that can give us an indication of kidney function um, uh, at a, a more timely manner. But at the moment, we're still using, we're still very heavily dependent on creatinines, which is not the, if you like, the best um, functional marker of kidney function at that moment in time. So I don't think it's easy to detect. Um, we're often chasing our tails by the time we detect cuckoo kidney injury. Then the last question about whether can it be treated or not so there's a misperception sometimes that uh, that this is something that can't be treated it will resolve by itself um but if you go back to what i was saying that um that by the time your creatinine goes up it's almost too late then it's so important for us to try and anticipate which patients might develop acute kidney injury and try and prevent it in the first place so this algorithm is from the British Association of Pediatric Nephrologists. They put a really useful guideline to, to think about AKI management. Um, and uh, the first step of AKI management is to risk assess all of your patients for AKI, to look at the high risk groups. So there's a lot with kidney problems, cardiac and liver problems, malignancy, um, uh, and dependency on others for access to fluids. So those are, for example, patients who are um, severely disabled, for example, those with cerebral palsy that are peg fed and that are dependent on other people for their fluids. Um, and then those on nephrotoxic medications as well. Then also thinking about the high risk scenarios that some patients go through. So those that have sepsis, dehydration, nephrotoxic drug exposure, or have undergoing major surgery. So if we can identify these groups at risk of AKI, then if we anticipate it, we can try and prevent it from happening. So, in terms of prevention and mon managing these groups, doing regular fluid balances, daily weights, urinalysis, serum creatinines, electrolytes are important, simple measures that can be done to closely pay attention to your kidney function. Maintaining circulation is, is essential, so trying to ensure that our kidneys are well perfused and removing any pre-renal acute kidney injury element. Um, and minimizing kidney insults, so for example, um, regularly monitoring your medication. So whilst the medication might not be nephrotoxic at normal kidney function, by the time your kidney function declines and your creatinine goes up, then your antibiotics or other medications may become nephrotoxic at those doses. So it's important to dose adjust your medications um, on a daily basis, checking the GFR and dose adjusting medications um, to be appropriate for that level of kidney function. I think very commonly we see that antibiotics are prescribed at high dose during for patients in sepsis. And then as the kidney injury progresses over the next couple of days from their, from their um, generally unwell state, the last thing ever to change is the antibiotic doses and you, and you will still get good antibiotic coverage with a reduced dose if your kidney function is lower, but especially um, cephalosporins, penicillins and so on amoxicillin, comoxiclav, you can reduce the dose if there's a severe reduction in kidney function and all of that information is available in the BNF and in our formularies. Um, 
the next step is recognizing AKI. So although we do blood tests, we don't always look at them or check them and we don't have any alerts. So having some kind of alerting system would be helpful. So if you could, if it flashed up on your computer screen or you're checking bloods, there was an AKI stage one, two, and three, or having some system in our hospitals, which um, as part of our ward rounds to, to classify a patient or identify a patient as AKI is an important step towards managing it. Um, and once you've I identified AKI, um, it's about continuous reassessment. So ma managing it um, with your investigations, monitoring your output, maintaining uh, perfusion, minimizing kidney injury by reducing nephrotoxic or other insults, um, and then continuing to re-monitor and reassess on a daily basis. And that is a consistent cycle that has to continuously go. And then of course, seeking support from nephrologists whenever needed if things are becoming difficult to manage. And the earlier you speak to nephrology, oh, I, have, I always feel it's better. And nephrologists are always friendly people that will be happy to help. Um, all of this is very important in pediatrics and adults. Um, and there was a Think Kidney campaign in 2014, which tried to educate the medical profession as well as the public about the importance of acute kidney injury. And I just thought some of these infographics were very, very stark and, and, and useful for us to recap. So in the UK, up to 100,000 deaths each year in hospital are associated with an AKI, and 30% of which could be prevented. So these are huge numbers. We talk about the number of deaths from the pandemic we're going through, but this is, you know, almost on the scale of that in terms of this silent killer that no one pays enough attention to. Um, and one in five people admitted to hospital each year as an emergency has an acute kidney injury, so it's quite prevalent. Um, and just interestingly from this survey, Epsos Mori survey, just one in two people know their kidneys make urine. So it's an organ that we don't know much about. I'm sure everyone would know what their heart, lungs and brains do, but not many people, it seems, know what the kidneys do. So having a general public awareness of the importance of looking after our kidneys is important. Um, Oops, sorry. So in 2014, NHS England issued also a um, patient safety alert recommending standardized early identification of AKI. And they created an algorithm for all hospitals to use in order to alert uh, clinicians to when an AKI happens. And there's this has been adapted for children, so it's very easy, much easier to do it for adults when you don't have to worry about a child's height, weight, and age. Um, but this is the pediatric algorithm that's also being used. Um, so you can, I'm not expecting anyone to take any of this in, but just to explain the complexity of designing an algorithm that will give you an automatic uh, alert of an AKI based on a creatinine, either being the first creatinine that patients ever had for their age, or based on previous comparing to previous creatinines. And so we did a study looking um, at how this NHS algorithm, AKI algorithm could be used um, and retrospectively applied um, in six hospitals, three tertiary hospitals and three district general hospitals to determine if um, using this algorithm, whether AKI is, is readily recognized um, uh, in these selected hospitals. Um, and it showed that in, in 57,000 creatinine measurements, there were 5,000 AKI alerts. So that's 10% of those creatinine readings had an AKI. And the majority of them, you can see two thirds were AKI stage one, and another third almost was AKI stage uh, two and three. This is the age distribution of those patients with AKI. So 60% of our patients in this, in this study had uh, were less than six years old, so it's a condition that can affect the very young, and this this coincides with those in particular patients who undergo cardiac surgery and almost universally all get acute kidney injury, and, that, and that's probably what makes the bulk of those patients. And doing a case note review of a randomly selected um, 123 patients, we could see that um, despite those alerts. Um, retrospectively identifying AKI, it, in the case notes, it was only recognized in, in one quarter of all patients who have an AKI. Um, and then when we look at their specific AKI management following an identification of AKI, 
um, if you identify it and recognize it, you have better BP control, um, a better fluid management, so increased fluid management, um, and you're more likely to have a repeated creatinine measurement. Um, however, one thing that we're never good at, even when we do recognize API, is documenting what an EGFR is, so trying to calculate that using the Schwartz formula. And we're still not very good um, at reducing nephrotoxic medications, even when we recognize an AKI. And also not very good at asking for renal support. So something that can, can also help improve these, these uh, extension phases of acute kidney injury is, is trying to get more nephrologists involved. And also another question we had to ask was, was follow-up arranged? Um, and yes, often uh, follow-up was arranged, but not usually for nephrology. And that's despite creatinine not always normalizing. So I'd always say that if your creatinine is not normalized after an acute kidney injury episode, then a nephrologist would always welcome a follow-up uh, appointment for longer term monitoring of their kidney function, especially to identify and weed out those patients that are likely to develop chronic kidney disease and could benefit from CKD management in a nephrology clinic. So I do believe it can be treated. We just have to pay more attention to it. And just to touch upon other treatments, um, I wanted to mention as well that when your kidney function is, is completely gone, as you all know, we have these options of hemodialysis, CVVH, and peritoneal dialysis. Each of them can be used as an acute, um, in, in acute management. I think there's a misconception sometimes that um, you can only manage acute kidney injury with CVVH in a PICU setting, but we can manage also um, an acute kidney injury on a nephrology ward with just peritoneal dialysis as well. So there are different modalities and different things that we can use um, on the nephrology ward. Um, and then of course, thinking about those babies. So we have a lot of babies in neonatal units and cardiac babies who, if you like, are sometimes too small for a hemodialysis machine, um, too small for CVVH. And also the only option for them is Peritoneal dialysis, but if they've had abdominal surgery, it becomes not an option, and, and that can be life limiting for these babies in some cases. So, there's efforts to try and miniaturize dialysis machines. There are two uh, the Carpe Diem machine, which is the one in the BBC article there, and also the, one, the, the machine here on the right is the NIDAS machine developed in Newcastle. There's two further options where we can try and perform a, a form of hemodialysis on babies um, less than five kilograms. So, and especially NIDAS can be used on babies of two kilograms. We haven't, it hasn't been rolled out yet um, in London, but I think there's, there are trials on the way. Um, and I think it's a case of selecting the right patient for these kind of things. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of these babies that have multi-organ failure, it's not an appropriate treatment. So to summarize the, Incidence of AKI is increasing in children. I think that's as we are developing, um, particularly as cardiac surgery is um, over the last couple of decades saving so many more lives. We're left with more acute kidney injury episodes and long-term sequelae from that. Um, there's an increase in patient mortality in the literature, and with some, in some cases, serious long-term sequelae. Um, it's not an easy condition to detect very acutely. Um, despite uh, readily available creatinine levels. Um, and it's important to bear that in mind when early recognition and interventions can make a difference. So we do have room for improvement in pediatrics and something that we can all pay more attention to. Um, before we go on to any cases, does anyone have any questions? There's a question on the chat box. Um, mm. It says, what about neonates? Um, is it the same in terms of the creatinine rise to define, I guess, the AKI? Yes. So a really good question. So we, we know that, um, that for neonates, there's this, there's this difficulty interpreting creatinine for two reasons. First of all, in the first couple of days of life, creatinines represent maternal serum creatinine. Um, so a, a newborn baby with a creatinine of 90 is probably indicating what the mom's creatinine is. And if it was a difficult deliver, delivery for mom and the mom had a high creatinine, doesn't necessarily mean that the baby's had an acute kidney injury. Also, the um, GFR of a newborn baby is not matured until a year of age. So the, the GFR slowly increases over the first year of life. 
So your natural GFR as a baby is lower um, as your glomerulus matures. Um, so all of that taken in mind, however, um, it's still important for neonates to, uh, with those complications, a creatinine is still an important marker of kidney function, if you like, after the first couple of days. And I think um, the best way to manage neonates and their creatinines and interpreting their, from an acute kidney injury point of view, is um, looking at trends. So if a creatinine is going up, up and up, then it's certainly an acute kidney injury. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about calculating GFRs in the first week or two of life. It's always going to be low, regardless of whether they're healthy or not, based on their height, their, their length, and their creatinine level. Um, but following the trends of creatinine is an, still an important way of monitoring their acute kidney injury. And also for neonates, urine output is very important as well, indicator of kidney function. So com a combination of following the trend and urine outputs. Does that answer the question about neonates? But it is a bit of a murky area. It's not as easy, I think, in the first couple of months of life compared to later on. Yeah, it does answer. There is another question. Um, it says, is there an easy way to have a ballpark uh, figure for creatinine range for differently aged babies and children? A ballpark range figure. So, um, so personally, I don't, I don't necessarily pay attention to the, um, to the creatinine number as an individual number. Again, uh, for my patients especially, uh, it's always about the trends um, and thinking about what was it compared to previously. Um, and then if I want to try and make an assessment of their function, of their kidney function, I'd much rather do an estimate of their GFR compared to the ballpark figure of what a normal creatinine or not is. And that's a very simple formula. It's 31 times their height divided by the creatinine. And that will give you an estimated GFR. Um, and the height is important because a six-year-old who is on the first centile compared to a six-year-old who's on the 99th centile will have different creatinines. Um, and um, if you like a six-year-old with cerebral palsy who uh, has muscle wasting uh, versus a healthy six-year-old with good muscle mass will also have a different creatinine. So I don't, I wouldn't pay too much attention to absolute values. I would, um, I would, I would, if you wanted to make an assessment of kidney function, it's better, first of all, to compare to previous and then secondly, to, to try and calculate a GFR using the Schwartz formula of 31 times the height divided by the creatinine. Um, and then if you wanted to assess that more formally, we can do something called an IAHEXL GFR, um, where we inject IAHEXL and then can measure um, directly what the GFR is. And we do that sometimes for patients where we don't think the creatinines give us a good estimate of kidney function for those patients who are chronically unwell. And muscle mass and creatinine release might be different from a, a child in there similar age group. That's all the questions for now. Brilliant. Anyone else got anything else to, to ask? Or, and please tell me if I haven't answered your question, then please interrogate it more. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll go to, I, I thought we could go through some cases and um, I actually can't see the chat screen, Julia, so you might have to tell me what, what people are saying. Can I? No worries, yeah. Um, everyone said um, thank you for their, for your answers. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and I'm really happy for people to unmute if you want to just shout out. It's probably easier if you do that um, for, for this part, you want to go through some cases. So, some first of all, some straightforward cases, which I'm sure will be very comfortable with, and then maybe some more difficult and more thought-provoking cases. So this is a six-month-old baby boy. He's had diarrhea and vomiting for three days. They've come in with sunken eyes and lethargy, and the parents have noticed a reduced wet nappies. So I think this is a very, this might be a standard thing that we might see in uh, our emergency departments. So these are the observations. Um, would anyone like to make any comments?
top is up at the gas up as well. Delayed cap refill time. Yeah, so very good. Prolonged cap refill time, so three to four seconds. So um, what does that tell us about this this baby in terms of their perfusion? Um, but the perfusion might be impaired. Absolutely, and if it's perf impaired to your peripheries, then, then there's a good chance it might be impaired to your kidneys. So you might be thinking this baby might have a pre-renal yeah. acute yeah. kidney injury. Um, very good. And the blood pressure you can see is also a bit... Um, uh, a bit low as well. It's a tachycardic with a low BP. Oh, I can see some comments. Very good. Yeah. Um, so hyperperfusion and absolutely an attack cardiac with low BP. So this baby seems to be in some level of shock. Um, the gas you can see is acidotic with a with a um, base excess of minus nine. Again, indicating this baby probably has a degree of um, uh, renal impairment or dehydration. So then we've got some bloods. Um, anyone want to make a comment on the bloods and what, what you deduce from that? Uh, a raised sodium and a yeah. low potassium. Yeah. A high so urea, very high. Very high urea, because he has 24.9. Uh, it's a very, you can tell this baby is probably very dehydrated. And the creatinine is 67, if you can see that as well. So probably a high creatinine for this baby, if you think about his age, three months old. Um, but the urea is disproportionately high. So you can tell that this baby, if they have a disproportionately high urea and a high sodium as well, is most likely to be water loss um, and being in a catabolic state. If you're catabolic, you metabolize protein and your urea goes up even higher. So this baby needs nutrition and fluid. They're very good. So that's a very straightforward case. I think we can all, um, and so, and, and the treatment straightforward, just need to, to hydrate the baby and you'll hopefully manage that AKI very well. Um, so five-year-old girl, um, previously fit and well, and then has developed bloody diarrhea for four days. Has presented lethargic and pale, and has not passed urine for the last 12 hours. So I'll let that sink in. Everyone, please feel free to pipe in and tell me what you think is going on. So the heart rate is 134. So Naomi said HUS straight out of the, out of the ballpark. Very good. Um, Observations, heart rate is 134, blood pressure is 70, respiratory rate 45, SATs 100%, capillary flow time three seconds. And this is the gas and the bloods. So what does everyone think about this? Definitely an AKI. So yeah, an AKI. What, what else is going on? Thrombocytopenia, anemia. Yeah. Thrombocytopenia, anemia. Very good. Yeah. Um, and um, what, what's the most worrying thing in that blood test? Do you think? Mm. The, the potassium. I mean, yeah. the crack. Yeah. Well, crack yeah, the crack. Really high. Cracking is very high. Patients not passing urine for the last 12 hours. Um, uh, and so, the hypocalcemia and hypokalemia both can affect the heart. So those would be concerned. Absolutely. absolutely. So what's everyone going to do? That's really low. And the, and the HP is 52, if anyone has also mentioned that as well. So. So this is a very sick child. You can see that these are, these are not very good blood tests. So what what are you all going to do? First of all, I guess the first question: when you see a child like this, um, you, you're going to get your do your ABC. If that's 100 percent, respiratory rate's okay. Circulation wise, the blood pressure is acceptable, but a bit on the low side. You can see um, for this child, um, a little bit tachycardic, but they're conscious and they're alert. And they could, their perfusion could be improved. The next question is, are we going to give them a bolus? Who would give this child a bolus, a 10 mil per kilo bolus? I 
I, I would, um, but we'll also consider giving blood. So you, you could give you could give blood or a bolus. And is anyone worried about giving a bolus to a? And someone said dextrose. Um, is anyone concerned about giving a blood transfusion to a patient with potassium six point nine? Yes, there's concern. So yeah, potassium first. Yeah, so definitely I would exactly. So we have to be careful with blood transfusions and kidney failure because um, that can it can often lead to an increase in potassium, and we wouldn't want the potassium to increase further than six point nine. And also the question about giving a bolus: this patient is not passing urine as well. So where's the fluid going to go? Especially if they have leaky capillaries and so on. But the answer is yes. We should definitely try a bonus because if you look at the bigger picture for this child, it's almost certain that this child is going to need dialysis. So uh, whilst you're considering um, your acute management in the back of your mind or with your wider team, you're going to be also arranging for this child to either be admitted to intensive care for organ support, which would be three CVVH, and or um, or, or may need a peritoneal dialysis cap to see might be on the phone to a transplant surgeon to get them ready for that. Um, so with that in mind and knowing that they're going to get dialysis access and therefore knowing that they're going to be ventilated at some point, it's, it's almost okay to give them some extra fluid to challenge them. You might, you might get pulmonary edema by challenging them with, with an anuric patient, but also, there might be an element here as well as HUS of impaired perfusion. We talked about the importance of perfusion. This this child has had bloody diarrhea for four days, has not been able to hold on to fluid, um, is probably dehydrated, um, and having a fluid bolus would, would be important. Calcium gluconate. So it's a very good question about calcium gluconate. I think with a potassium 6.9, you are obliged to give calcium gluconate so some good questions there so first of all i'm going to talk, first of all about bicarbonate and calcium gluconate so yes i think you have to look after the potassium and i think whilst you're doing all of your acute interventions putting them on a salbutamol nebulizer is important to try and help stabilize the potassium and you can give them back-to-back -back salbutamol neps for that calcium gluconate stabilizes the myocardium so it won't reduce your potassium but it will certainly it might protect your myocardium from arrhythmias um, just a word of caution about calcium gluconate in that calcium gluconate is very bad for your veins and very painful when it extravasates, as it often always does from a peripheral cannula. So if you're going to get calcium gluconate, I think it's important to have very good IV access and try and get a wide wall cannula and anticubital fossa when you give it um, to make sure that it gets to where you want it to get to without causing pain and damaging your veins. So if possible, try and give it through a white floor cannula. But also then thinking about um, this child, you'll probably in an, in, in an A&E setting, put them on a cardiac monitor and do an ECG. And if your ECG looks perfect um, without any change in the T waves, then you probably got some time to secure some good access and give calcium gluconate. So it's about thinking through why you're doing it. If your ECG shows that you're not sure about the T waves, they look a bit tented, and so on, then yes, absolutely give the calcium gluconate. But just to be aware that sometimes it's not a pleasant medication to give intravenously, and especially through small veins. Would would I give bicarbonate? So yes, this patient's very acidotic, you can see, 7.2, and that can correct the, um, the potassium. So if you have renal acidosis, you can give bicarbonate um, a minimal per kilo, and then that can drop your potassium. So that could be a strategy you'd want to give as a holding strategy for sure. One word of caution with bicarb is that a bicarb infusion will drop your calcium also. So this patient is also hypocalcemic. So I would always give the calcium gluconate or give any calcium product before giving bicarb in this situation. It's very important to remember that because giving the bicarb and correcting the acidosis and correcting the bicarb will certainly drop your calcium and with a calcium of 1.89 you you may precipitate a seizure in this patient and the ionized calcium is 0.9 so you wouldn't want it to go below that so just to be careful of bicarb with hypercalcemia um once you've once you've given some calcium then absolutely you can give some bicarb in this situation which can help reduce the acidosis uh, help reduce the hyperkalemia it's very important um 
and then once you're, I, th I think in terms of a transfusion, I probably would hesitate to give a transfusion whilst the potassium is that high. If you've done some conservative measures already and you've managed to drop the, the potassium with, with some salbutamol, or some bicarb, maybe some insulin dextrose, then you can think about a um, transfusion. Um, as long as you know that you've got dialysis access lined up. So I would do it and, and you can often give transfusions um, at the time of surgery when you're when you're putting in access for dialysis, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis or CVVH. So quite a lot of things to consider in this patient. I think just to recap, you've got to think about the um, the perfusion and making sure that they're well perfused, giving them some um, giving them some fluid to, to manage it. I wouldn't ever give just dextrose neat to this patient. You give them 0.9% saline to try and improve their perfusion. Um, and uh, thinking that whenever you're giving fluids to an aneuric patient, that you have to be ready to ventilate them and intubate them if their respiratory function goes off. And also doing all of the, the your work to try and improve the potassium through um, those, uh, uh, again, salbutamol, thinking about bicarb and um, insulin dextrose. But of course, um, as mentioned, the safety point about bicarb, make sure that you correct the calcium. And then also think about calcium gluconate um, to protect the myocardium. And, and in these kind of situations, you want to call a nephrologist early um, or an intensive care unit early, probably both at the same time to, to manage this patient. Also important to notice the white cell count is very high and it's been shown with HUS that the higher the white cell count and the neutrophil count, the worse your longer term outcomes. So indicates a more severe course of, of disease. And just for interest, this is the x-ray of that patient after some fluid perfusion. So they did develop pulmonary edema um, and ventilated, um, but again, on a, on a filter, it's quite easy to manage and remove the excess fluid. In the course of HUS, um, so um, sugar toxin E. coli is the most common cause. You have different variations of that. A157 is the common one that we see. Pneumococcal HUS can cause very aggressive course in HUS. So again, those patients that are presented initially with a sore throat, for example, but haven't had the diarrhea vomiting might lead you to think about pneumococcal yeah. HUS. And then there are some atypical genetic causes of HUS where there's a dysregulation of complement management um, and you have um, uninhibited complement activation in your immune system, which leads to HUS as well. Um, and this is the pathophysiology. You have endothelial damage from either the toxin or the complement overactivation it develops microthrombi in your capillaries, so particularly your glomeruli, but it can be any any area of microcirculation. So even in your brain, you can get seizures, you can get pancreatic dysfunction, and um, you can get small bowel. HUS can affect any organ. It can be quite nasty sometimes, but it's most mostly affected, mostly the most de detrimental in most children in in the kidneys. And those microfrombi result in, in a breakdown of your blood cells just by mechanical shearing. And then that leads to an acute kidney injury as your, your micro circulation gets clogged up. Um, so any questions about that? Just, I guess another thing to say about HUS is that in um, most patients who develop HUS um, and are aneuric for a month, on dialysis, 90% of them recover their kidney function. So it's usually a good good outcome at the end, but obviously need lifetime monitoring of their kidney function in the future. But most do well. Um, so one last case, a six-year-old uh, six girl who's developed fevers, cloudy urine and lethargy, but previously un, uh, not known to, uh, to pediatric services. Um, what, background of poor appetite, general general failure to thrive, has incontinence and constipation and, and drinks a lot of water overnight. This is a true story. The parents um, said that they, they described their, their daughter as a little Viking because she drank pints and pints of water. And does anyone have any thoughts? Um, observations looked fine. There's nothing particularly um, untowards with those. And the urinalysis lit up like a Christmas tree for blood leukocytes, nitrites, and protein. Um, so suggestive of a UTI. And pH of 7.29, a bit acidotic there. You can see with a bicarb of 18 and base excess of minus 8. And 
And these are the bloods. So you've got an anemia there, the HP of 78, CRP of 125, so an in, in, uh, infection going on, creatinine of 378, urea of 21, phosphate 2.8, which is an interesting thing. We didn't normally see that in acute kidney injury, and a, and a PTH of 600, it's very high parathyroid hormone. So does anyone have any thoughts about what's going on in this patient? Or what would you do next? So Mala says, check glucose. So yeah, very good thought. Um, the glucose, I'll say, was fine in this patient. It's not diabetes. But yeah, any patient who's polyuric and polydipsic, you'd want to check the, the glucose. Anything else? So ne nephritic syndrome. Um, you'd have to elaborate on what you mean by nephritic. Uh, syndrome. Spe specific gravity. Urine MCNS. So definitely in urine MCNS and you want to see, I think it's certain this child has a urine infection. With a, If you remember going back to the original history, it's maybe this child had cloudy urine. So there's not many reasons to have cloudy urine with fevers other than the UTI. Um, so I think um, uh, specific gravity, intracranial lesion. So I think it's thinking of, everyone's thinking about the polyuria and polydipsia. So just to, I guess to emphasize this point, any child with a structural abnormality of their kidneys, or, you know, congenital abnormalities of kidneys or urinary tracts, so CACUT is the most common cause of kidney failure in children, um, is likely to be polyuric and polydipsic. So another reason, maybe an unrecognized reason for polyuria and polydipsia. Um, your kidneys with structural abnormalities tend to have problems concentrating urine. So not because you have a problem with ADH production, but because your kidneys don't have the necessary nephron mass, the the, the tubules available to be able to respond to the ADH you're producing. So usually the first thing that goes in chronic kidney disease is your urine concentrating ability. So you become polyuric and polydipsic. Um, so I'd always suggest any patient who's polyuric polyuric polydipsic. Um, if their glucose are normal, then you always just check their kidney function and get an ultrasound scan of their kidneys. So a renal ultrasound scan is a really good, and I can see that's the next suggestion here. A renal ultrasound scan is a really good idea for this patient. And then when you do the ultrasound scan, you can see here that you've got two kidneys that are both very abnormal. One is that the kid this kidney here has lots of, lots of cysts and very little normal renal parenchyma. So you could say this is a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney, so lots of cyst dysplasia. And this kidney here is just, if you see the other kidney is a dysplastic kidney. So it's, um, you have a loss of corticomedullary differentiation. You can't see that nice delineation between the cortex and the and It's very bright as well. And the, uh, when you measure it, it's quite small. So this is a dysplastic kidney on one side and a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney on the other side, both part of the same spectrum of conditions called congenital abnormalities of kidneys, urinary tract. Um, so this, this child's probably born with this abnormality in their kidneys. It's got to the age of six years old with failure to thrive and polyuria, polydipsia. Um, and so then when you come back to the blood tests, you can see the creatinine is high, which you'd expect with a chronic kidney disease, but could that be an acute kidney injury from the um, AKI from the urine infection. So we don't know what the baseline creatinine is. The baseline creatinine might be 50 or it might be 200. It's difficult to say with chronic kidney disease. Um, but that phosphate of 2.8 is an indication that there's a chronic thing going on here. This patient has had poor kidney function for a long time to have a phosphate of 2.8. And secondary hyperparathyroidism as well, which we see with chronic kidney disease when there's an inability. Um, to convert your vitamin D with the uh, alpha hydroxylase enzyme that your kidneys are um, are important for. So, so that's so this patient has, if you like, an acute on chronic kidney disease. Um, 
and I and I just this is a really interesting case, and I thought I just wondered if it, this is an abdo X-ray. You can see this patient is very constipated, and the parents mentioned the constipation as well um, as a real problem for this child, um, uh, despite lots of laxatives. And you can see there's lots of constipation and lots of you know fuzzy poo on the X-ray. Can anyone see any other abnormality, some some big abnormality on this in this patient's X-ray? The bones? The bones, what about the bones? I think the, the femur, the, and the head of femur doesn't look normal. Yeah, so you could, you could say that the, the head of femurs, then they're not very well ossified. You can say, I, I would agree with you there, that this patient probably has osteodystrophy, some, some metabolic bone disease from some chronic kidney disease. We call it chronic kidney disease, metabolic bone disease. It used to be called osteodystrophy, but it's now CKD, MBD, where um, uh, you have, uh, if you like, very high PTH, which increases your bone turnover, and, and if you like, calcium wasting from your bones. So reduce mineralization of the bones. Yeah, anything anything else that's obvious in the sensory? So if you look at the uh, if you look at the pelvis where my mouse is, you might notice that there's no sacrum. There are no sacral bones. This this child from has the last um, vertebrae, if you like, is L5, and S1, 2, 3 is, is not there. So um, this patient has sacral agenesis, which is a very rare congenital disorder. But related to that, has very poor innovation to her bladder and to her. Um, uh, her rectum, so it's not able to, that will explain the constipation. It explains the urine infection with an unsafe bladder and urinary retention, and related to that has had chronic kidney disease. Um, so this is something that um, that was uh, as a true story. When, when whoever did the baby check commented, uh, your baby has a cute bottom, that's what they said to the parents, because it was a small cute bottom, but in actual fact, it was a cute small bottom because of the uh, sacral agenesis that made it look very petite. Um, so something, again, I think it would be very hard to pick this up in any baby checks, not something we were expected to find. But um, this baby, had, this child had failure to fry for six years, was never above the 0.4 centile. So it could have had a blood test much earlier to think about its kidney function. And it's been picked up at some point because of an, essentially a urosepsis that developed later on down the line related to the unsafe bladder. The patient's doing very well at the moment in chronic kidney disease clinic um, with good stable kidney function, but in the future we'll need a kidney transplant. So those are three cases. I think we've run out of time, so we'll stop there. Um, but has anyone got any questions or anything to, to address or ask at the moment? I think that's all. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Moham. Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Julia, and good luck, everyone, and um, have a good rest of the week. Thank you. <laughs>